We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. This edition is a little different. I was invited to interview my witness at an international conference which takes place every year in Berlin called Mansein, which translated literally from the German is to be a man, and is dedicated to help men grow and evolve to face the challenges of the 21st century. In the show notes and at the end of the podcast, I will give details about how to find out more and perhaps attend yourself. Due to the pandemic, the 2021 conference took place virtually with questions from the audience texted to me. My witness is J.J. Bowler, who is a poet, an author and an educator. He's been a youth worker specialising in behavioural and mental health problems. His new book is called Mask Off masculinity redefined. Now, Mask Off suggests that being a man involves a lot of performance. When did you first begin to realise that being a boy involved putting on a mask? Hi, Andrew. Thanks for the introduction, firstly, and thank you to everyone for yeah putting together this conference and being here. Very delighted to be here. And yeah, to answer your question, I think for me, that realisation that being a boy or being a man required a certain level of performance first kind of happened when I was a teenager and through lots of like different kind of experiences whether it was in sports or whether it's at school or at home but I think the thing for me was that culturally I was from Congo francophone African country but grew up in London actually experiencing the differences of expectations in terms of the way that masculinity and manhood is perceived between the two cultures was something that made me realise very quickly that it is actually a performance. So possibly you were more attuned to it because you were getting messages of two different masculinities that you had to perform in. I mean, in your book, you tell a fabulous story. In Congolese culture, you have uncles, and these are men who are involved with bringing you up from the church, youth organisations, etc., etc., and you're walking through the streets of London holding the hands of one of your uncles. How old are you at this point? I was about 13 or 14 years old. Now, what does in Congolese culture holding another man's hand mean? So in Congolese culture, and also not just Congolese culture, you know, across different African countries like Nigeria, Uganda and so forth, across countries in South America or in Asia, India and so forth, Holding hands with someone, particularly a man to a man, is a sign of like affinity, of brotherhood, of camaraderie. You know, that's something that's just very normal that was done in our culture. And so when we held hands, like as a child, say like 10 years old and so forth growing up, that was maybe seen as like, okay, maybe they're a child. But when we got to those teenage years and became independent, we still carried on those traditions. And even now, there's still a lot of like older men who still do that. And I think the conflict for us, someone kind of my generation, is having grown up here in the West, in London, you kind of get those mixed messages where holding hands is interpreted differently. Is you know, but actually in our Congolese culture, it's more a sign of a bond between two men. Yeah. So how are you feeling walking through this London estate holding hands with your uncle. Allow yeah, us yeah. to step into your shoes, how you felt at that moment. So, you know, when you're a teenager, you're impressionable. And I think one of the biggest things for teenagers is humiliation. You know, you don't want to be humiliated. You're worried about perception. You're worried about being liked, being respected as well. And so being acutely aware of what two men holding hands means and the way that it's looked at in society actually made me really nervous about holding my uncle's hand publicly in the street. So when we were in our community centres and doing our own activities and kind of closed groups, it was totally fine. But when we went out into public and, you know, for my uncles, they were set in their ways and they were very confident in who they were. 
So they didn't have the same kind of pressures. But for me, it's kind of like I had one foot in our culture, but also one foot in another culture. And so I felt really nervous about being judged, about how I'd be perceived, about how things would be taken out of context and so forth. You know, it was a really difficult situation to navigate at the time. So you grew up in a household with four brothers and a father and a mother. I mean, that's a pretty masculine dominated household. What did that teach you? Well, it's really interesting. I think for me, it was an advantage, particularly because of the perspectives that our parents raised us with. So having four brothers almost meant that there were no gender roles. So we were all expected to cook and clean and so forth. Whereas like perhaps if we were a household of like split between brothers and sisters, maybe that would have been different. But generally, we kind of grew up being expected to know all of these things. And then also the, watching our father also participate in like the gender roles and traditional gender roles that, you know, is typically seen as like a woman's job. Like watching our father participate in that actually normalized a lot of things for that. When we first came into the country, it was our mum who went to work and our dad who did the traditional homemaking roles and then vice versa. And we just did things to make ends meet. So it wasn't really a case of, you know, you're a man, so you must do this, or you're a woman, so you must do that. It was more so how can we work together as a unit to, you know, improve our lives. So we're going to be talking about redefining what it is to be a man. And I think probably people can realise I'm quite a bit older than you. So I've been through a couple of redefines before. When I was growing up in the 70s, we had something that was called the new man. And Mm. the new man was aware of his feelings and he was prepared to change nappies. I mean, my father... I can promise you, never changed a nappy in his whole life. In the 90s, you might remember this, we had the new lad. Do you remember the new lad? In the new lad, it was okay to like football and beer and pornography, but in an ironic way. I never quite understood the difference, but that's how it went. And so there would be magazines where celebrity women would be photographed in their underwear sort of kind of thing. And that was a celebration of something. The problem is with every one of these redefinitions, it always seems to come down to what a real man would do. So this is going to sound really weird, but in the 70s, there was quite a big debate and a a discussion that said, real men don't eat quiche. And I I remember when I was sort of growing up thinking, oh, blooming heck, this man stuff is going to be really complicated. You have to watch what food you eat to be considered to be a real man. In those days, quiche was sort of a bit like the equivalent of vegan um, brownies sort of today, you know, sort of at the cutting edge of food. Do you recognise this idea of the real man trope? And how is your definition going to get around this problem? Yeah, I mean, I definitely recognise it. And I think there's a lot of other examples as well of the different labels that have been used to define a new kind of man. You know, like you remember when metrosexuality was popular and that basically meant that, you know, you're a man who showered regularly and and <laughs> looked after your skin or something, do you know? You didn't use shampoo and conditioner in one bottle. You maybe had two separate bottles it was just, and you ironed your clothes. These kind of really weird expectations. And I think for me, when I speak about masculinity redefined, is really a step towards actually us removing ourselves from the confines of these expectations of masculinity. And rather than just staying at the redefinition of it, we're asked to move towards actually just being free to be however we are and whoever we are. So I don't, you know, subscribe to the idea of a real man because there's contradictions all over the world. But I think those are terms that we should be aware of, but not confine ourselves to them and not apply ourselves to them, especially when it comes to young people and young boys, because the expectation for them is so much more stronger and so much more forced that they feel like they have to live up to these. And then it can be really damaging if they don't. So as a youth worker, what sort of pressures do you feel that young men are under today when it comes to the tag of, and we'll use the tag, real masculinity? What sort of pressures does that put them under? I feel like young people, and young boys particularly, nowadays are exposed to so much more 
via the internet, via social media. I mean, on the one hand, the internet's been brilliant. Social media has been brilliant. It's allowed us to connect with so many different people around the world. The two of us together wouldn't be here without it, would we? Exactly. You know, so it's been fascinating. But I also think on the other hand, that it has been quite difficult for young people, young boys in particular, because of how they've been exposed to images of materialism, of you know, hypermaterialism, sexualization of themselves. We don't really talk about how young boys are sexualized. For example, I wrote in my book about the story of like Chris Brown and how he lost his virginity at eight years old. And he was talking about how from the ages of eight to 15, he would regularly watch pornography so that he can be prepared to perform and satisfy a woman. And for him, his identity, his masculine identity was tied up in like sexual performance. And that is the case for a lot of young boys as well. And so that's not really a conversation that's being had. And so like those are the pressures that exist. And another thing is, Body dysmorphia really is an issue amongst young boys. You know, so if we're looking at platforms such as Instagram, you know, we're seeing that young boys are more so, and older men as well, are more so influenced by the expectations of what kind of masculine body that a man should have. So there's all these movements which are positive about women's body image and, you know, having plus size models and all of these stuff, which is really good in terms of women's representation. But on men's representation, you don't really see that as much. You know, the ideal man is still seen as like someone with, I don't know, like the rock type of body. You know, no discredit to the rock. I think he's a great person, but like that kind of aesthetic, which is incredibly difficult to have if you're not basically a professional athlete. (laughs) So when you were a youth worker and you were working with these boys, how much do you think their problems were down to social economic material? How much of it was due to ethnic backgrounds and how much of it was due to male roles? How can we define which of those things are actually causing the mental health problems or were they just specifically family stuff? Socioeconomic kind of factors obviously play a large impact on these situations, but it's not an exclusive. I don't think there's any factor, whether it's socioeconomic factor, whether it's race, whether it's sexuality, et cetera, that play an exclusive impact on the way that young men actually behave in terms of their masculine expectation. Because across the board, whether it's middle class or upper class, whether you are gay or straight, whatever ethnic background, there are so many toxic expectations that continue to be passed on between groups so there isn't really anywhere in the world where there's like an ideal kind of equality or parity between men and women or an ideal parity between the way that men express themselves across the whole so there's some parts where things are done a little bit better but you know and i give the example of congo for instance where you know holding hands and kissing each other on the cheek is very normal but there's some other parts where it's incredibly toxic in terms of male expectations and what's really interesting for example when i wrote the book one of my friends read it and he is a white middle class public educated, which means he went to a private school. He's now a professional. He's a lawyer. You know, he's done really well for himself. And he was saying how much he related to that book, even though he came from different circumstances. And one of my favorites as well is I, especially with Zaikan Man, is that I get so many messages from people in Germany, from readers in Germany, particularly men in Germany. And one of my favorites was a German man who messaged me and he said, you know, I'm a white 50-year-old German man. We have completely different experiences, but I relate to this book so much as if you wrote my own story. And I think that just shows like how across the board that regardless of race, gender, sexuality, etc., that still as men, we're socialized with these expectations. Now, you talk in your book about the patriarchy. I think we need to define what you mean by that. And then when we've defined it, then we'll look at how it impacts on us. What do you mean by the patriarchy? Well, patriarchy essentially is a hierarchical system which rewards or gives privileges to men for particular behaviours. 
that allow them to kind of have access to things, whether it's access to jobs, healthcare, and so forth, at a better rate or more exclusive rate than women or people of other genders. And it rewards men for the same behaviors where it punishes others for. So say, for example, let's say male aggression and male violence. That's generally seen as almost like a positive thing. If we look at how men are rewarded in terms of our aggressive behavior, look at the representations on the screen and so forth, it's almost seen as like being more manly, that you are more of a man if you are able to fight, if you are able to kind of look more intimidating and aggressive. Whereas like a woman carrying herself in the same way doesn't carry the same rewards. And so it's these kind of like contrasts in terms of like expectations, in terms of like the way that we're socialized and what we're rewarded for. We can also look at the example of, for instance, sexuality or sexualization. So the idea is that as a man, if you are sexually experienced and you have multiple partners, or if you're a man in a relationship and you cheat, like that's kind of considered to be a bit of a standard normal expectation. Whereas like, uh, you know, a woman is supposed to be pure, not supposed to have multiple partners and so forth. And so these are quite archaic, but there's remnants of these that are still strongly held within modern society as well. And so all of these essentially impact the way that men and women and people of other genders live their lives. So how do you think that the patriarchy, is it only positive for men or can it be negative for men too? I think that it's a double-edged sword. So whilst as men, there's many things that we are privileged by, there's also many things that actually, in terms of patriarchy, really, really harms us. So if we're talking about the way that we are socialized or this expectation that as men, we have to be strong, we have to be stoic, we have to be the providers, this impacts us in many other ways. The statistics show that the majority of people who are homeless are men. As a man, you're more likely to be a victim of substance abuse or substance addicted or drug user. You're more likely to be a victim of violent crime you're more likely to be killed as well as a man, obviously by other men. And so we have to think about it in the sense of like, how beneficial is this thing to us truly if something is harming us just as much as it helps us? And what is the alternative? You know, is the alternative actually more likely to provide more healing and more growth for us? And I think that because we haven't really moved towards the alternative yet, because so many of us are stuck on the idea that we have to be a man, quote unquote, and that patriarchy is beneficial to us. A real man, not just any of them. Exactly, a real man, right? That we haven't really moved towards what it means to let go of those kind of privileges that the patriarchy gives us. Because you see, one of the things I always find very difficult when people talk about the patriarchy is that I'm very aware that lots of my clients were brought up in a matriarchy. Here's an example of one of my clients said, my mother wanted me to grow up and rule the world, but live next door to her. So she had incredibly strong expectations for him. And to a very large extent, here's a man whose mother is dead, but we're still unpicking some of the matriarchy but at the same time as there being a patriarchy there is a matriarchy running as well yeah i mean absolutely so with the patriarchy what i mean is on the wider societal level so if we look at institutions if we look at the actual powers and the way that things are legislated patriarchy in that sense but in terms of the way that mothers may raise their sons there's variations. You know, I think like, and, and you know, I can definitely say this in the example of like my brothers and, and my household, like we did whatever our mom told us to do, <laughs> you know. Quick so was, yeah, like she ruled the house, you know, like whatever she said went. And so it wasn't a case of like us having to wait for dad to get home or anything like that. Like whatever she said almost went. And so I think there's also the issue of the expectations that mothers raise their sons with. And some of that may be positive, but some of that may also be internalized patriarchy. So there may be women and mothers out there who also have quite a toxic, perhaps, view of the way that men or real men should be and then raise their sons in that way. But actually, that's actually damaging them as well. Can a man be a feminist, do you think? 
I mean, absolutely. So I think a man can be a feminist. Personally, for me, I align with the ideals and values of feminism. You know, I'm absolutely a supporter of it. I mean, I wouldn't have written this book were it not for feminism. And a lot of the feminist texts that I've read has actually allowed me to understand myself better and raise awareness about these issues that we're talking about now because they were first brought up by feminists such as Bell Hooks and Judith Butler. But I think for me personally, the reason why I don't personally define myself as a feminist is because I think that for me, what is important is being a feminist ally. So as a man, I don't want to take myself into women's spaces and say, you know, I agree with what you're saying. I'm one of you guys. I think the work for us to do as men is like what we're doing now is us speaking with other men and saying, hey, guys, we need to open up more. We need to talk about our mental health. We need to talk about aggression and violence. And we need to talk about gender-based violence and all of these things. So it becomes a case of like, where does your positioning align? really. And I think for me, it's like the values and stuff, what I'm kind of speaking about definitely has feminist kind of background to it. But I think the work needs to be done amongst other men, because that's where the root of the problem is. So you use another word in your book, which I think is very interesting. And I think we should unpick as well. Intersectionality. This is, I'm going to quote you, the various axes of oppression come together. So Help me understand intersectionality and how the different axes of oppression come together. So intersectionality was essentially written by Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a professor and theorist. And it's it's probably been around for the best part of 30 years, actually, 30, 40 years. Very popular in the last five years or so. Exactly. And I think there's many ways where it has been misused, but there's also really other ways where it's helped us to positively understand the world. And just in kind of brief, it's just to say that we are multiple identities and the way that the hierarchies of society affects those identities and the way that we're treated is different for each person. So obviously we're all in this room as men, and I'm sure there are perhaps people of other genders as well, but I'm just saying like generally it's a conference for men, but also within that category, even just between us two, you know, I'm a black man, African man, and so forth. And so there may be some men who are from Germany who perhaps identify themselves as white or as European or as Caucasian or whatever the case may be, identify themselves as straight or as queer or as gay and so forth. And these different intersections are basically roadways in which they come together and form who you are. And that impacts how you're treated within society. So that I know that Myself, for example, if I use myself as an example, as a black man, yes, I experienced systemic oppression via racism, but I also experienced privilege via patriarchy, male privilege. And so it's like that kind of crossing over can help me to understand the different way that we're treated, that I may be treated as a black man in the Western world. So it's almost like you get a step forward and a step back sort of kind of thing. You get points, points equal prizes to use a a game show from England from a very long time ago, but you get fined as well for certain things. You know what? You might be onto something there. It could be like an intersectionally board game (laughs) where uh, you're like, you kind of roll a dice and then you get to go forward a little bit and a bit back depending on, you know, where you're from and how you identify and so forth. But yeah, essentially it's like that. In the performance and expectations in your experiences as a black man, is that, do you think, in black culture is different from German and Anglo-European culture? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You don't have to really compare, for instance, you know, I'm coming from black British to like white German. I think even just for me, the comparison of expectation between black British and black Congolese is already like wide enough to draw those comparisons. And that's something that I experienced. So amongst my black Congolese upbringing, as a man, the expectations is that you're very well dressed. I mean, I don't know if anyone knows about Congolese culture or seen like Sapel videos, but like as a Congolese man, you have to be able to dress. It's almost like our national identity. If you're not able to dress and look after yourselves, take care of your clothes, iron and so forth. I've never yet met a Congolese man who doesn't like to iron their clothes. Me and all my brothers, we love ironing our clothes and make sure our clothes are really all of these things. <laughs> Dressing colourfully, all of that, right? Being able to dance, it's almost like a national trait as well. So dancing with your hips and, you know, look quite feminine. But yeah. if you look at Black British example, that's not really the expectation. That's not really the representation that we see here. And so that's even just amongst the same race, if you will, in terms of Black, but different ethnicities. And so... If there's that difference, even just within black culture, if you take it out 
and compare black to white, whether it's white, German, Italian, and so forth, American, there are so many different variations. And even just if you compare white British to white German, I'm sure already people were kind of seeing the different expectations of masculinity amongst the two nations. And so across the board, there's just variations all around, which again, just kind of like reinforces the point that we were saying previously about masculinity being a performance. You're listening to a special edition of The Meaningful Life, recorded at the Manzine Conference in Berlin with JJ Bowler and questions from the virtual audience. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. During our conversation, I'm going to be putting in questions from the audience, and we've got one from Jürgen. And he says, what were the key points on your journey to becoming the man you are today? Were you ever macho? Oh, yes. (laughs) Oh, my God. Give me an example of you being a macho man. (laughs) I'm so glad that I grew up in an era where... How old are you, by the way? I'm 34. So kind of my teenagers were late 90s or, well, early 2000s, really. But in that era, we didn't have mobile phones. We weren't really able to record and so forth. So we just went about our everyday. Yeah, I definitely had my attempt at being macho, which was hilarious because how that manifested like at that time particularly being very influenced by what is largely u.s hip-hop pop mainstream culture the yeah. band clothes and so forth that like i was heavily influenced by that but what was really really hilarious is that i was actually just like a happy-go-lucky kid right so within myself i was very happy-go-lucky i got on with everyone really just kind of like nice and friendly and just got on with what I needed to do. But on the surface, the way that I acted, I felt like I had to be this kind of like strong, macho person to be taken seriously. Luckily, the older that I got, I mean, reading really impacted me heavily. But the more that I read, I read about different cultures, spoke with different people, and also got an opportunity to travel as well. That opened up my world so much in terms of being able to be comfortable with who I am and however I am. And so the older that I got, more I felt comfortable to let go of those expectations. Where did you go that gave you a different view of masculinity? I mean, what was really interesting, so, okay, so I'll tell the story about when I went to India. So I spent a few months in India in my, I think it was early 20s at this point. This experience, so we went out, and uh, this was in New Delhi, I think we were. In, yes, in New Delhi, we had a, a day where we was just out about in town and so forth. We went to the cinema. Now, at the cinema, there were like a group of young men as well, you know, just kind of like hanging about as you do, also going, which is not really up to much and so forth, also looking to go to the cinema. But they were all holding hands and they were even like l- locking pinky fingers like that. Oh, how nice. <laughs> right? And I saw that and I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. And one of the things that like, I'm really lucky that I'm able to pick up languages quite quickly if I'm exposed to it. So I just kind of like pick up a few words and I was able to speak with people and so forth. And then um, one of the guys was like, you know, started holding hands with me and we were going to the cinema and we all went as a group to the cinema. Suddenly in that moment, I remember like, okay, this is normal in terms of like my Congolese culture, but this was outside of that culture. So in that moment, I'm holding hands with another man who's a stranger and I thought to myself, well, it would be quite rude if I just let go and told him I'm not comfortable. But actually, I had to really reflect and think, well, why am I uncomfortable with this? You know, and it wasn't for any significant reason. So I just kind of like sat with it. And it was those experiences, really. I mean, there's been there's so many stories I could go on, but those experiences that really allowed me to open up my mind. Here's a quote from your book that I'd like to unpack. We cannot face any problems that exist unless we are confronted by them and in turn confront them. Unless we inform and educate ourselves as well as unlearn toxic behaviours and talk to each other about what those problems are. So what are our toxic behaviours that we need to confront? I think one of the main toxic behaviours that we need to confront as men 
whether it's within ourselves or amongst our families or friends or social circles, is this idea that we have to repress everything, that we don't feel our emotions, that we're not emotional, that we're more, you know, logical, logical, but we don't have emotions and that we can't open up and speak about how we're feeling. I think that leads to so many other problems, whether it's mental health, whether it's violence and aggression, it can be like a snowball effect. So I really think that is the main thing that I think would allow us to really transform the way that we're feeling. And I'll give an example. Like I remember the flatmate that I used to live with, randomly, we had a couple of our guy friends come over and we were just all kind of relaxing and chilling out. And then suddenly the conversation fell really, really deep. And, I, and these are friends that I'd had for years. And it was just randomly at that moment, we all were speaking about our mental health. It wasn't planned. It wasn't like prearranged or anything. But we realized that so many of us were experiencing the same thing, whether it's low moods, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety and so forth, that we could have spoken to each other about it all the time. Like we would see each other regularly, but this was the first time in about five or 10 years that any of us had mentioned it, whilst also looking at each other and thinking, wow, that person has it all figured out. I need to be more like them. And then they're looking at me perhaps and thinking, wow, I need to be more like them. But we're both carrying something that we're struggling. And so I think that is really the major thing that we need to address and confront. I mean, it's amazing if you do start talking, everybody else actually opens up. Exactly. I had a client who I think was going to something like 30th anniversary school reunion sort of kind of thing. And so I was going to be seeing people he hadn't seen for 30 years. And I said, are you going to tell them that you're in therapy at the moment? And he said, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, actually, if you open up, you might be surprised. And when he came back, he told me that every one of his school friends, bar one, was either actually in therapy or had been in therapy. And they all decided the one that wasn't in therapy was the one that needed to be in therapy. <laughs> but, but actually, if you speak about these things, you'll find it's as a very much to use the current idea, me too, that yeah. uh, people will talk about this. I've got another question, and I think this one fits in quite well with the theme of toxicity. This is from Jörg. He says, do you think that allowing men to be aggressive can release aggression in a healthy way? So this is the thing. I think we have to be really careful. So for me, aggression is when it's without control, right? And I think there's a way to channel that energy that we might have. You know, sometimes if we have restless energy, it's helpful to exercise, to go to the gym, to do such things as martial arts. And I'll give an example. So one of my close friends is a Muay Thai instructor. I've known him for about 10 years, but I only started taking classes maybe like three or four years ago. Well, what and is this? Muay Thai. So it's a martial arts from Thailand, a form of martial arts from Thailand. But yeah, so it's largely like kicking, punching and all of those kind of things, right? And so I remember before taking those classes, I had quite a narrow minded view about what they consisted of but actually going to those classes and what was being taught in those classes i learned that martial arts is actually about de-escalation fighting is not what it's about it's about self-control it's about never allowing really yourself to go to those situations where you actually do need to be aggressive or violent. It's about how can you actually always maintain the peace and try to keep the peace as much as possible? How do you deal with your own internal self and any internal conflicts that you might have? And so I think it's important that we do have outlets. Absolutely. Uh, as men, you know, if you have, a, I'm someone who has a lot of energy and so forth. So I, I really do think like exercise and so forth helps us relieve kind of any mental burdens that you might have. So I really encourage people to try and exercise go to the gym, martial arts, those kind of things. But I do think that there is a distinction between that and generally aggressive behavior. And I think aggressive behavior is actually when it's without control and order. And I don't think it's so much without control. I think it's without recognition. I mean, as a therapist, yeah. I would say you accept every feeling and report it to yourself. Actually, I'm feeling angry now. and mm -hmm. it's an acceptable feeling. And yeah you're aware of it, then you might decide what you're going to do about it. You might be angry because you feel that something is unfair. 
And, you know, if you're, it's unfair and you report the feeling, I'm feeling angry because you won't allow me to do ABC or you want me to do this and I don't want to do it. So reporting anger, reporting feeling angry is fine. People can cope with the reported stuff. It's when it's actually you're not really aware of it because you're burying all of your feelings. And that's when it's going to actually explode out and actually become aggression. I think we accept the feelings and then we have to start processing them. Absolutely. And that's something that, especially as men, we're just not taught. Maybe so many of us go through it in a different way and learn how to handle that and learn how to process our emotions and feelings and so forth. I think oh, and many of us also don't. I think you're being a little bit too negative. I mean, I've been a therapist for 35 years, so I've sat there and listened to men and women talk to me. I'm a couple therapist. And I can assure you the men that arrive now are very different from the men that arrived 35 years ago. There has been huge changes. And I don't think that's always recognised in the debate. The yeah, world. no, I mean, absolutely. I do think there has been huge changes and developments across the decades, definitely, particularly amongst younger and younger men. However, I do think there is still a long way to go. Yeah, oh, I would definitely agree with you on that. Let's have another question. This one's from Wilfred. How is the patriarchy related to the fact there are more poor men than women, that men take more drugs and are more often in jail and get killed more often? Oh, well, absolutely. And I think that, for example, just reflects what I was saying earlier about the patriarchy being a double-edged sword. So in many ways, it benefits us as men. If you look at the economic wage gap, if you look at gender expectations and the gender norms and roles in society, but in other ways, it really does harm us. And so those are ways that the patriarchy harms us in terms of like drug abuse, in terms of victims of violent aggression, in terms of the prison population, majority of prison population being men. And if we want to talk about prison population and incarceration, majority of prison population, particularly in the West, we know that young black men are imprisoned at a higher rate. And so that's also part of an issue where we talk about intersectionality and how things like patriarchy and racism combine to impact people of different groups in different ways. This is the thing. It's not to say just because we are privileged that we're only privileged as men. There are also ways that we are harmed by patriarchy and we have to address and realise that two things can be true at the same time. Yeah, and I think that one of the problems is it's very easy to become defensive rather than actually looking at how actually the system is knocking your hands back as well. Exactly. Um, and the tendency is to think, oh, because my hands are being knocked back, that here's somebody else that's getting a pull-up. Yeah. And it's... I, I say that, I, I mean, I've definitely, like I've been saying this, but I've come from that defensiveness. You know, like I've, along the years, I've had people I've had to really sit down with and be like, ah, oh, okay, what is this defensiveness I'm feeling when they say, well, as a man, you're able to, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not me. Like, for example, you know, the hashtag not all men, when all of that coming out, when uh, largely women are raising awareness about gender based violence and aggression and so forth. Uh, and, you know, my initial reaction when that came out years ago, I was like, whoa, not, not me. Like, I'm, I don't do that. So, you know, not all men. Well, but actually, it's that there are enough men who are behaving in this way and, and there are fewer consequences for those men that we have to actually address. I think that if we can somehow find a solution to support each other, that that doesn't take away from whatever it is that you might be experiencing. And so male privilege doesn't necessarily mean that you won't have difficulties in your life. That, you know, you can be privileged in terms of your race, your gender, your sexuality and so forth. But on an individual level, that doesn't mean that your life is going to be easy. Just because you're privileged doesn't mean you've had it easy. And so I think sometimes people conflate the two. Whereas like, I think it's about looking at it from a kind of like systemic standpoint. I mean, one of the ideas that I really liked in your book is that actually you're not going to redefine masculinity as one thing, that you're talking about masculinities. Help me understand that. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's really something that's been going around for a while. I mean, I don't claim to have been the inventor of that necessarily. R.W. Connell, who is a professor and sociologist, has a great book called Masculinities, in which it's an edited book of 
different essays where people, writers from all over the world are talking about variations of masculinities. And so I think that from my perspective, that kind of perspective of moving from masculinity to masculinities allows us to really open up and understand that there are different ways to be a man, that there isn't just, you know, a real man and you have to perform or act in this way, that, you know, whether you're perhaps softer, more tender, or whether you're perhaps more stoic, those are all of those are equally valid. You know, if you want to be the protector and the provider, but you also want to be nurtured and cared for, those are also equally valid, like as men. And I, you know, and I say this pejoratively sometimes in a joking way, but, you know, use the example of the big spoon and a little spoon, right? Like as men, in, you know, in, as, and I'm talking about heterosexual relationships here, but, you know, it, it's okay to be the little spoon. Are you in a relationship at the moment? I am. And I've had to learn how to be comfortable being the little spoon and to also oh. be nurtured and to also be taken care of. Because I think that perhaps more of us want to be taken care of than we actually realise. Yeah. It is difficult to say, look after me, without yeah. it actually coming across as weakness. Exactly. Exactly. And that kind of fear of being seen as weak or vulnerable is something that really impacts us and holds us back sometimes. I've got another great question for you. What's Mm -hmm. great about today's men? What do you personally enjoy the most about being a man? Yeah, that's a great question. That is a great question. What's the greatest thing about being a man? What's the greatest thing for me about being a man? I think it's at least the way that I experience my manhood and masculinity is that fluidity. You know, for me, I really feel like there are some days where I feel strong and there are some days where I feel vulnerable. And actually that I feel really comfortable in going between either or. And I'm very lucky to have the kind of friendships and family and relationships where I'm able to do that. And I think that that's one of the things that's really, really positive about being a man. But also, I find that it's really something very positive about this generation of men as well. You know, being able to connect on that level, like now more than ever, I'm meeting more and more young men who are able to instantly have that kind of like open hearted conversation. And for me, I think that's beautiful. I would say it's two great things about, for me, actually having passed 60, you just don't care what anybody thinks anymore. Yeah. You can have your definition of masculinity. And to be perfectly honest, I don't care. But I do think the one thing that I don't think we recognise as men that is wonderful is that I can go, I live in Berlin, it's not a dangerous city, but, you know, at night I can go around and I don't have to think twice about whether I'm Mm -hmm. going to be safe. And there are as many women who could go out their door at three o'clock in the morning and not be worried about or look around the corner sort of kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I do think that is something. When we're sort of talking about the redefinition of masculinity, and we've sort of rather laughed at the real man trope, but are there still some things from the real man trope that we actually still need today? Well, this is the thing. The society that we live in, the global society that we live in, reinforces a lot of these ideals in terms of like the real man and in terms of like gender roles. But I think that if the structures of society were to continue changing, then we wouldn't need to stick to them as much as we do. So let's say like over the past 20, 30 years, where you're seeing more or improved equality in the workplace, right, and more parity in terms of like access to education and in terms of earning and earning potential between men and women. Obviously, I'm not saying it's not perfect, but there's definitely an improvement between like 30 years ago compared to now. That has slowly reduced the idea or the expectation that the man has to be the sole provider or the sole sole owner and that the woman stays at home. Now that situation has become more of a choice rather than the norm or the expectation. And I think if we continue to make progress forwards and we change not just ourselves in terms of our perspectives, but also on a societal level, on a hierarchical level, which is represented in our judicial systems, I think like that impact is going to be incredible. 
So I don't know if you're aware of the name of your book when it was translated. Thy kind man, which literally translation means don't be a man. Yeah. Can a man not be a man is the next question I've been sent to ask you. Yeah, I mean, of course. And I say this in that sense, right? Whether it, wherever it is your manhood, whether it is your race, or whether it is your gender, your sexuality, whatever the case may be in which you identify yourself, when you wake up in the morning or when you're alone at night with your thoughts or when you're in your private spaces where you feel safe and where you feel comfortable, is the first thing that you're thinking of that I'm a man? Probably not. You know, and I know that for myself, I don't really think about being a man, especially when I'm by myself. I don't really think about being a man or whether I'm living up to that. It's only when I'm, I step outside, I'm confronted by society and expectations that these conflicts come into place. But when I'm by myself, I think about whether I'm loved. I think about compassion. I think about, you know, empathy and connection and fulfillment and joy and happiness and all of these things. And so I definitely do think that in terms of the don't be a man, it's essentially a way for me to say, let's not limit ourselves to the expectations of what these labels impose on us. What advice would you give the men listening to you today? So in the book, I try to give some kind of like suggestions at the end, because I do feel like it's incredibly important when we read something that shifts our perspective, that we actually take some action towards it. So I do think that's important. One of the things that works really well for me that I would suggest is journaling and trying to find ways to creatively express yourself. So express what you're thinking or what you're feeling so you don't hold it all inside. And, you know, this can be just in a basic way. Just get a diary and just write down maybe like before you go to sleep at night or when you wake up, what you're feeling, what you're thinking about. And just keep doing that for the period of like six months or a year and then refer back to it. And it's just amazing to see your own thoughts reflected back to you. I don't think we have really a lot of opportunities to do that. So I would highly recommend that. I would also recommend that if, I, and I, you know, for everyone who's attended this conference, you've attended for a reason. So, you know, there, there's something about you that's also asking questions and wants to make steps forward and think about more. So I say that to say this, if you are the person in your social group, particularly in your male social group, who's aware of these issues, try to find a way to like create a safe space amongst yourself and your male friends or try to find a group of male friends where you feel comfortable associating and being vulnerable in this kind of way where you can express yourself. That, for me, is something that I, I did that accidentally, actually, from about 2010 to 2012. One of the areas that I lived in, in London, I bumped into an old friend and we realized that we had both been going to the same cafe, but just hadn't realized. So then let's, we just made a plan to start meeting up every Saturday morning. And then what happened at first, the first couple of months, it was just us two. And then a few of our other guy friends kind of caught on and then it became a group of five of us. Then it became a group of roughly about 10 of us. And we would meet every Saturday morning and it would be such a great balance between just, you know, having a a fun time, jokes and connections, but also deeply connecting in terms of like our emotions and talking about what we were Mm -hmm. going through. And after, well, about two years after, one of my friends messaged me and said that, you know, he just wanted to thank me because he was going through a really difficult time at that time. And that group, like coming together, meeting up, really had a positive effect on him. And so, yeah, if anyone out here can do something like that, I'd really encourage that. And also therapy as well. Like just, I think therapy, obviously, is difficult to access. Some of it can be expensive, maybe oh, through... In Germany, we have this wonderful thing that on your Krankenkasse, the equivalent of the National Health Service, everybody mm-hmm. in Germany can get therapy. You That's get amazing. Therapy in Germany, use it. I mean, I have to say that do get a male therapist because mm-hmm. it's difficult to talk about male stuff, really. Yeah. To a woman. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. 
although lots of men are perfectly happy to talk about these things with another woman, I think that to an extent reinforces the idea that women are the ones that look after our feelings for us Mm -hmm. rather than actually responsible them for ourselves. Um, One of the things you say is that men need to let go of the anger. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, so I definitely do think that in terms of like the socialization process, what we're exposed to, what we're represented as normal or not even necessarily normal, but expected male reactions or expected male emotions, that anger is seen as more normal for men to express them love, for instance. And some of our experiences growing up has meant that we've experienced anger in quite an intense level. And I think it's really important for us to be able to let go of that so that we're not carrying it. But I would once say the complete opposite. I would say hug it close, understand it, because... Generally, most people, once they get hold of their anger and they begin to feel it, that's actually got a many aspects to it. We don't generally feel one feeling. We have a whole range of mm-hmm. Always what comes through when men hold on to their anger is sadness, fear, anxiety, a whole range of other feelings. And so I'm sorry, I get really angry. No, no. Say, yeah, no. Anger yeah, so when I say let go, I don't mean block it out. I don't mean repress it. I don't mean throw it away. I definitely do mean understand and process it. But what I mean is don't allow it to become the burden or the norm of your life. And so from my kind of like experience and what I've seen as well is that that can often be the first reaction to a situation of something that might upset you as men. So what I mean is like to let go in that sense. And yeah, obviously there's different ways that this might work differently for different people. So for some people, it might be that they it's something that holds on to as a motivating factor and so forth. If you understand that that's what's working for you, then fine. But and I do mean in terms of like that actual burden that so many feel. Because a lot of the times the fears, what we're actually frightened of often is something inside ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I joined an organization called the Radical Fairies. I don't know if you've ever known, know what the Radical Fairies is. But it sounds brilliant though. (laughs) Um, So it's a gay organization that actually is prepared to celebrate the femininity inside men. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to be was in a place that actually recognized that. So, you know, I actually had to recognize there was a fear about that inside me. Actually, sometimes going towards what you're frightened of is the best way to actually deal with it. Mm. So that actually go towards what you're frightened of to actually understand what that fear is and get to the point where you don't care if somebody thinks, you know, oh, my God, I'm waving my hands around too much. That's too feminine. You have to go towards that rather than go away from it. Yeah, no, I mean, I absolutely agree. I think there's definitely a Venn diagram of where we kind of cross over. But yeah, I think it's just for me in terms of, like, I'll give you an example, especially in inner city London, there's been several occasions where I've seen two young people, two young men walking towards each other, and they're both looking at each other angrily. No one has said anything. And then if you stare at each other for just too long, it can become an aggressive situation. And then it turns into a fight. And then, you know, there's been cases where lives have been lost. And so those kind of situations where it's like, oh, you can let go of the expectation that you need to react angrily. And actually, what does it mean that if you see another man and you actually express compassion and love even, you know, so in in, in that sense? So another question, this one's from Ben. What role do guilt and shame play in the psyche of men, in your opinion? Wow. Yeah. We need to That's talk about guilt and shame, don't we? That is a great question. And I don't think I've actually really been asked that question before. I think even just in general, guilt and shame are such incredibly powerful emotions that are often used in ways to kind of manipulate often the way that people behave or act and so forth or the way that people perceive themselves. And I think that guilt and shame is something that impacts us a lot in terms of men. And so we can feel 
shame, for instance, if you look at, you know, we were talking about socioeconomic factors. For a lot of young men who grew up probably working class or poor in an impoverished circumstance, like there's a lot of shame that you can feel around being in that circumstance. There's shame that you can feel perhaps if you get into a relationship and you're not able to provide. And there may be like guilt associated with that as well because you're seen as not performing to the male expectation or toxic male expectation. And so I think guilt and shame are incredibly powerful, particularly in shaping and, and pushing people towards really negative toxic views. But I think what I would really recommend is like, how do we use not just guilt and shame, but other emotions as reflective tools so that we can process the way that we're feeling. And so I think ultimately, like, that's the end goal. We have to understand how things are being used. If you're in a situation as a man, are you being guilted into performing or acting this way? Or are you being shamed into performing or acting this way? And then correct that. Yeah. And once again, actually, you sort of need to understand the shame to Mm -hmm. think, is this something actually, you know, I am really ashamed of, or is Mm -hmm. this something that's been given to me and I've taken it on? Exactly. Um, And with all of that, you really do need to understand your emotions to be able to navigate through all of this. I say to my clients that, you know, it's terribly important to understand your feelings because they're sort of a bit of a a signpost to what you should actually do. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not an instruction just because I feel angry. I'm going to do angry things. But, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a signpost. It's useful information you're going to need to process what you're going to do. But, Mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, as men, we've been brought up not to be interested in our feelings, you know. And even worse than that, we're going to pass them over to women to interpret them for us and manage them. And you think, for goodness sake, you know, these are our feelings. We have to deal with them ourselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one thing that you do say at the end of the book, which I have to say hallelujah to, is that men need love. Yeah. Um, And I think they need it from other men as well as from other women. Absolutely. I think that particularly like non-sexual intimacy between men it's almost like the antidote to all of like these problems that we're experiencing. So male affection and male bonding, whether it's in terms of like touch, whether it's in terms of like intimacy and so forth, that is something that we deeply, deeply need. And I've said this several times that it's very worrying that we live in a world where it is more normal to see two men fighting than two men who are in love. Of course, things are improving, but there are objections to the way that two men in love are represented. Like, look at the movie industry, for instance. Every time there's a movie about two men in love, it's like, oh my gosh, it's a really big deal, which it is a big deal. But the fact that when we see how many action movies and so forth about men fighting, about men driving these really fast cars and so forth, and all these kind of like, you know, nothing that actually fosters intimacy between men, like, or or love between men, like none of this is really represented. So, and, and I, I look at like Moonlight, for example. I don't know if anyone in the audience yeah, watched that. Moonlight, yeah. but I, I absolutely love that as a film, and you know, it was so so much has so much compassion and humanity in that, and I think we really need to see more of it. So, I mean, one of the sadnesses of the fact that we're on Zoom is we can't close this with a good man hug. Well, you know what. <laughs> It's so funny, right? Because every time, whether it's like workshops, and this is obviously prior to the pandemic. So before I wrote this book, yeah, like I mentioned, I was doing lots of youth work and um, workshops and people stayed for hours and hours and hours after talking, connecting. Everyone left with like a big hug and were saying how they felt more comfortable expressing themselves in that space than they did almost like in their own social circles in their everyday lives. And so this is what we need. Like, it'd be great to finish with a group hug. And if we were actually in the room together, I would be inviting every man to hug the man next to him. Yeah, but absolutely. We can't finish that way. So I'm going to finish off by asking you the question that's on our lips in this conference. What do you think the future of masculinities looks like? 
I mean, I'm very, very optimistic and hopeful about the future of masculinities. I think that the fact that this conversation is happening not just here in the UK, not just in Germany or across the EU, but all over the world, shows that more and more of us are realizing, not just as men, but also everyone else, that the way that we're socialized is not helpful entirely to us and to other people. And so I think what the future holds is that hopefully this kind of fluidity and this idea of masculinities, the conversation will continue to grow, but then it will also be impacted on a societal level, on a judicial level, and in terms of policy as well. And so that's what I really hope for, you know. And yeah, as, as for me, I think part of the work that we do, whether it's the books that we write or these conferences that we put together, is a step towards that. Thank you very much for being our guest here on uh, Manzine and uh, good luck with your book in both German and English. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you for being an incredible interviewer. That was very exhilarating. And uh, thank you to everyone for those listeners and tuned in as well. I hope you've enjoyed this special edition of The Meaningful Life. And if you'd like to find out more about Manzine and the guests they have for the 2022 conference, there's details of how to find out about the website and all the necessary information in our show notes. In every edition, we have a special list of extra information that you will find useful and details of all our guests. Before we finish, this is a good time to remind you about my supporters club. It costs me a significant amount of money to create this podcast. I'm an independent podcaster and each week I dip into my own pocket to pay for production, engineering and technical support. If you'd like to help with that, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.